So I'm told that people come here and speak, and then after that they go on the Colbert Report and, uh, and John Stewart. I don't know if I'll have that, that option, but it's nice to be here. All right, so I'm going to talk about fractals and splines. So I, I kind of assume that you've heard the word fractal before, and we're going to see many pictures of fractals. Spline, spline is just a synonym for polynomial. So if you don't like the word spline, spline means a lot of polynomials, polynomials strung together. But I think for today's purpose, we'll just talk about polynomials. It'll be simpler. So you've all heard of polynomials, so now you know. We're talking about polynomials and fractals. And uh, I'm not intending today to teach you anything useful. This is going to be entertainment. But there is a philosophical point to today's talk, and that is that fractals, which you may think of rather as complicated objects, maybe you didn't see them until you got to the university, and polynomials, which you probably heard about in high school, these are really the same thing. Okay? That's sort of the broad philosophy of this talk, and that's what the marriage here is about. So I'm going to show you that the ways we generate fractals can be used to generate polynomials, and ways we use to generate polynomials can be used to generate fractals. So we'll see how that goes. So here's a collection of fractals. You've probably seen some of them before. Some of them look very abstract, like the Sierpinski gasket or the Koch snowflake. And some of them may look more organic, like a tree or a leaf. But these are all fractals. And there's certain things I want to point out about them that uh, are useful to know. Yeah, so this uh, Sierpinski gasket, you can see, is made up of sem several smaller copies of itself. So it's self-similar. All that means is it's, it's uh, made up of, 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 of pieces which are the same but scaled-down versions of the same thing. And this is often true with fractals. I mean, you can see it uh, a little bit uh, with the snowflake and certainly with the bush and the tree. Another thing you can see is that um, in the, in the uh, gasket, you know, the white and the black sort of interpenetrate. For simple curves, you, know, you can see the, and we'll see this, uh, for example, with polynomials, you know, see the white and, the, and you see the blue here, and they don't interpenetrate at all. But for fractals, they often interpenetrate. And this has something to do with the dimension of the fractal. We'll come to that, to that in a minute. Uh, the other thing you can see with fractals is like with the snowflake, for example, this is an example of a curve which is continuous everywhere. There are no breaks in the curve. But it's not differentiable anywhere. So every point on the curve is a peak in some sense. It's like every point looks like the absolute value at the origin. So these are often considered very strange objects. OK, so these are a collection of standard fractals, and we'll see more of these later. On the other hand, Questions? yeah, sure. So you said that some of them are self-similar. Are there fractals which are not self-similar? Well, all the ones. So the question is, uh, these fractals are self-similar. Are there fractals that not, are not self-similar? Yes, but I, um, today the talk will be restricted to fractals that are self-similar. I mean, if you think about, say, Julia sets or the Mandelbrot set, it's not so clear that they're self-similar in the way I'm talking about today. But the kind of fractals I'll talk about today, and I'll, I'll be more specific about what kind I'm talking about today in a little while, are all self-similar in this sense. Okay? Yeah, feel free to stop me at any point, by the way. There's not many of you here. I don't know who's out there, but feel free to stop me and ask questions. So. Okay? Okay. So these are fractals. They look a little bit complicated, but we'll talk about how to generate them in a bit. And here are polynomials. So these are fairly simple objects. So here we have a, a parabola. And uh, you might say, well, the parabola, maybe it's self-similar. Pretty much any piece of the parabola looks like any other piece of parabola. So maybe, maybe it shares that property with fractals. Maybe not. But here we have some cubic curves. Here's a curve with an inflection point. Here's a curve with a self-intersection point down here. Here's a curve with a cusp. So for example, this, this, this is just a cubic polynomial, but it's not made up of smaller things that have self-intersection points. There's only one self-intersection point. So you might think, well, these are definitely not fractals in the sense I just talked about. But I'll, I'll try to convince you otherwise uh, in a little while. So these are our players, the, uh, the fractals and the polynomials. OK. So some. Uh, some comparisons. The fractals I'll talk about are self-similar. Uh, the polynomial is self-similar. Maybe yes, maybe no. The fractals typically have dimension greater than one. That's this inter interpenetration between the fractal and the boundary, where some parts look kind of gray. And that you know you can actually compute these dimensions. And often these fractals have dimension that's greater than one. And the polynomials certainly have dimension that that's one. Whatever dimension means, it's clear that simple polynomials are one-dimensional. Um, we saw that you can have fractals that are continuous everywhere but differentiable nowhere. Well, of course, polynomials, you can certainly differentiate. 
everywhere. They're infinitely differentiable. <laughs> polynomials have parameterizations, and that's how I'm going to generate these polynomials. Uh, do fractals have parameterizations? I'm going to argue yes in a little while. And there are other characteristic properties we'll talk about in a little while that may be shared, may be not shared. I want to talk about those as well. So I'm going to start initially talking about polynomials. And the way I'm going to represent polynomials are as Bezier curves. People know about Bezier curves? A few. OK, so I'll explain to you what a Bezier curve is. Just a polynomial. Just another nerm, name for a polynomial. But let's, uh, let's look at pictures. So here's a picture, two points. If you have two points, you want to make a curve, you make a straight line. What if you have three points? So here are three points. Well, you can make a polynomial that interpolates the points. We can move the points around. And we can generate a polynomial interpolating the points. It's a parabola, not difficult. Well, if we continue with interpolation, here's four points. I can make a polynomial that interpolates four points. Looks a little bit odd because it, there's a bit of overshoot here. Right? This goes a little higher than maybe it should, but I can move the points around. And yeah, I can get a polynomial to interpolate those points, no problem. It's called Lagrange interpolation, by the way, just polynomial interpolation. Here I have a lot of points. They're all in a straight line, so if I want to interpolate them, I'll get a straight line. But here's what happens if I move this point off the line. What you see it happening is you get, well, of course, the curve follows, goes through all the points, but you get these oscillations, these kind of wild oscillations in the curve. There are no such oscillations in the data. Right? The data maybe is flat, then goes up and comes down, but there's these extra oscillations in the curve that's sort of forced by this constraint of, of interpolation. So typically, we don't insist on inter interpolation when we do, uh, say, geometric modeling. We give up interpolation to get the shape right. This shape is not right. These oscillations are not in the data. So instead of doing what's called Lagrange interpolation, which I've just been showing you, we do what's called Bezier approximation. So here's three points again. So again, we get a parabola, but the parabola doesn't go through this point. But if we move this point, the curve sort of follows along. These, these blue lines are tangent to the curve and go through this point. We can move the points. We'll still get a parabola. We've just given up. For now, we've given up interpolation. We interpolate these two points, but not the middle point. We can do four points. Here's four points. Again, we interpolate the end points, but not the, the two middle points. We can move the points around. And again, the curve sort of follows along. It doesn't interpolate but it sort of follows along. So the idea is to, in, to approximate shape rather than to interpolate the data. So here are those, all those points again aligned in a straight line. Now look what happens if we move the middle point. So we don't see that, those wild oscillations. The curve does not interpolate all the points, but it sort of gives the right shape. I mean, the data is flat, then it goes up, then it comes down. That's what the curve does. So those are Bezier curves. They're actually polynomials, so let me say a word about the formulas for them, how we actually write them down. So we start with a, a collection of polynomials. So these are called basis functions. So usually you write a polynomial, you think I'll write it in terms of 1, t, t squared, t cubed. We're just going to use a different basis. So the basis are given by what are called the Bernstein basis functions. And here they are. I've just written them down for degree n. And you've probably seen these before in another course, namely the course on probability theory. But we're going to use them in approximation theory. So these are the Bernstein basis functions. And maybe one property that might be useful today is that they actually sum to 1. So if you add them up, you add these up, then if you expand this formula by the binomial theorem, you get this. And of course, that sums to 1. Only fact you need to know. All right, so now we take these basis functions, and we take some points, p sub k, and we multiply them and add. And that generates a curve. Okay, so it's a function of t. As t varies, we're going to get a curve. If the points p, k lie in the plane, then we'll get a curve in the plane. So this is shorthand for two equations. There's an equation for the x-coordinate. So p, k is two coordinates, x, k, and y, k. Here's our equation for x. Here's our equation for y. As t varies, x and y vary, and we get a curve in the plane. That's called the Bezier curve. It's just a polynomial with a different basis, but it has these nice properties. So here's a picture again. So here we see the curve, and here we see the control points. I've connected them with straight lines. That's called a control polygon. Controls the shape of the curve. You saw when I move the points, the curve kind of moves along with it. Lots of nice properties for Bezier curves. Of course, they're polynomials. They have all these nice properties. The one uh, I showed you today was the variation diminishing property, which meant there's a theorem that one can prove that says they won't, the curves won't ever oscillate more than the data. 
So unlike interpolation, we have this nice property that things don't oscillate too much. And that's why we've gone to Bezier curves. I'm not going to dwell on this today, just mention that it's a property. I'm going, what I'm going to dwell on today are some algorithms. So there's a number of algorithms associated with Bezier curves to evaluate, to differentiate, to subdivide. And in particular, I'm going to look at subdivision. So let me say a word about this. So here's another way of evaluating a point on a Bezier curve. We have this formula down here for evaluating points on a curve. You plug in values of t and outcome points in the xy plane. But you can also do it this way. Take your control points and put them down here. So I'm going to do this for cubics, but this works for any degree. And then do linear interpolation. That is, take this point and multiply it by 1 minus t. Take this point and multiply it by t and put the result here. Do the same here and the same here. So this is linear interpolation, straight lines, basically. Now do it again. Take these lines and apply linear interpolation to them. Multiply this one by 1 minus t, this one by t, put the result here. Same thing here. And then do it one more time. And what comes out the top is, uh, depends on the parameter t and on the input, these control points, turns out to be exactly the same as this formula. So you're going to take this on faith today, but it's easy to work out. And this works for any degree. Again, I've illustrated for cubics. If you had more control points, then instead of going up three levels, you'd go up four levels or five levels or whatever numbers of levels. So now we have two alternative ways of evaluating polynomials. One is to plug into the formula, and one is run the algorithm. Now, there's a particular reason I've shown you this algorithm. I mean, I'm not just interested in alternate ways of doing things. I want to show you another algorithm that's really fundamental to, to polynomials and to the analysis of Bezier curves. Here's the picture again. So here's a point on a Bezier curve with parameter r. And what I'm going to do is try to split the curve into two pieces. So Here's the point of parameter r. This is a polynomial. The black curve is a polynomial. It's actually a piece of a polynomial. Because I'm looking, I look at a Bezier curve, I only look at a piece of the polynomial. But any piece of a polynomial is a Bezier curve. So if I say, well, I only want the piece from here to here, right? that's a piece of a polynomial. It should have control points. So there should be some cues that represent this piece of the polynomial. And similarly, there should be some R's, some new control points, that represent that piece of the polynomial. So this is called subdivision. I'm splitting the Bezier curve into two pieces. Why do I want to do this? Well, even from the picture, you can see that the two control polygons, the new ones I got, are closer to the curve than the original one. And if I iterate this, these control polygons actually converge to the curve. So this is one way of, of rendering the curve is just by doing subdivision and then displaying the control polygons. And I never have to worry about evaluating polynomials. OK, that, but I have to have a good algorithm that, given the p's, will generate the q's and the r's. And it turns out I have such a good algorithm. It's the same algorithm I just showed you before. So I take the same algorithm I showed you before, and I suppose I want to subdivide at the parameter r. I run the algorithm, and off of this side, magically, you get the q, the q control points for the left side of the curve. And off the other side, you get the r's for the right side of the curve. And this works for any parameter r. But, well, between 0 and 1. OK? So here's the picture again. Here's what I want to do. Here's subdivision. I want to get the Q's and the R's given the P's. And here's the algorithm. Just run this evaluation algorithm and read off the Q's and the R's from the algorithm. So it's very simple. And then you can iterate this process, and I'll show you that in a second. And what I use this process for is for rendering. So you know, if the uh, control polygons are a good approximation, I render them. Otherwise, I subdivide and I render the pieces. I continue to do this until it looks good. I can also use this for intersection. If I had two Bezier curves, if I could approximate them with straight lines, I could intersect them. Otherwise, I subdivide. If I subdivide enough, each, each piece will look like a straight line, then intersect the straight line. So it's a way of getting piecewise linear approximations to polynomials. And linear things we can do very quickly. So some pictures. So, uh, OK, let's look at this. So uh, suppose I want to render this doing subdivision. So you can see the curve here. I'm going to subdivide the control polygon and get two control polygons. You can see it's already close. That's one subdivision, two subdivisions, three subdivisions. You can't tell the difference between the curve and the control polygons. Here's another example. One round, one round of subdivision. Here. Two rounds, three rounds. You can see pretty quickly that the control polygon converges to the curve. You can do this with any Bezier curve. Here's just the simple parabola. 
one round of subdivision, two rounds, three rounds, and you're there. So it's a very quick way of rendering. I don't have to do any polynomial evaluation. All I have to do this is this simple subdivision algorithm, iterate, 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 and I'm there. Okay, so that's polynomials. So I'm in the introduction to polynomials. That's how I'm going to think about polynomials. Bezier curves, and I can generate them very quickly by subdivision. What about splines? So I need to show you how I'm going to generate splines, and then I want to show you it's the same thing. That's the argument today. Oh, fractals, rather. Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you fractals, algorithms for generating fractals. Then I'll argue polynomials, fractals, same thing. So, uh, back to here. Another Mathematica notebook, so give me a minute to pull this up. Okay. So let's, we're going to look first at, say, the Sierpinski gasket, Sierpinski triangle, and see how we can generate that. So uh, give this a minute to, to run. Run down here while it's running. And uh, don't need that guy anymore. Oh, while we're doing that, I should show you one more thing, by the way, about subdivision for uh, for uh, for Bezier curve. So here have another example. And you know, I was doing subdivision. I was always sub subdividing at the parameter half. It's converging nicely to the curve. But I can change that parameter. I can subdivide, say, at, you know, maybe a third. It changes the the uh, initial subdivision, but if you iterate that subdivision, it still converges. So I can move that initial parameter instead of subdividing it a half. I have a lot of freedom on where I can subdivide. It really doesn't matter. It's independent of that parameter. Okay, fractals. So here's the Sapinski gasket. looks complicated. How do I generate that, that gasket? Well, the, the easiest way I know is to start with the outer triangle. So we'll go back just to the outer triangle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale this triangle by a half from the vertices of the triangle, from here and here and here. So if I scale by a half the triangle three times, I'm going to get three triangles. There they are. Ignore the upside-down triangle in the middle. Just take these three corner triangles. And now I'm going to iterate that process. As I'm going to take the same three scaling transformations and apply them to these three triangles. If I do that, I'll get nine triangles. And then 27 triangles, and you know, you iterate this, you can pretty quickly see that it's going to converge to the Sierpinski gasket. So it's a pretty simple, pretty simple process. Now, if you go back to my Bezier curve, I do subdivision on it. If I move a control point, or the control polygon, I change the curve, I can run rerun subdivision, and of course, it will converge to the new curve. So the, the Bezier curve depends on the control polygon. So what about the fractal? What about the fractal? So we can think of the control polygon for this fractal. We can think of it as the triangle. So what if we start with a different control polygon? I run the same algorithm. That is, I'm going to still scale by a half from the corners of the triangle, but I'm going to start with something else. For example, a square. Okay? So I'll start with a square, run the same algorithm. What's going to happen? So I have three transformations. I apply them to the square. I'm going to get three squares. There they are. Run it again. Nine squares, 27 squares, 81 squares, big number of squares. And if you haven't seen this before, it's kind of startling that it didn't really matter. With the Bezier curve, it mattered. It mattered what your control polygon was. If you change the control polygon, you change the shape of the curve. But here it didn't. It's an attractor. You can start with a single point. Here's a single point. Run the same algorithm, so you have these three transformations you're going to apply to this single point. So you get three points, you get nine points, you get 27 points. But it doesn't really matter what point. Every point is converging to the entire fractal. This is a property of the fractals I'm talking about today, that they're attractors. So it doesn't matter what you start with, you're going to wind up with, with this. Now you can ask yourself, well, I'm always going to wind up with that. What if I wanted to wind up with that? How am I going to do that? Because remember, the algorithm I'm using always winds up with the same thing. I want, somehow I want to warp it. Now, my argument today is going to be, well, this is just a Bezier curve. So how is that a Bezier curve? Well, you have to hang around and find out. 
All right, other things. Just to show you, this wasn't just a property of the, the uh, Sapinski gasket. Here's a triangular bump. Right? And what we're going to do is replace every line on this uh, little triangular bump, this triangular pulse, by a little tri uh, scaled down triangular pulse. So we'll have four transformations, each transformation replacing a line by a pulse. When we do that, we get something like this. And this is the Koch curve, right? a piece of the Koch snowflake. And this is a curve that's continuous everywhere and differentiable, nowhere in the limit. And again, this doesn't really matter what you start with as long as you use the same transformations. So I've changed what I start with, but I haven't changed the four transformations. And if you iterate again, you'll see, okay, it looks a little crazy to begin with, but it's all going to straighten out in the end. It's an attractor. It doesn't matter what you start with. Okay. Lots of curves like this. I'll show you one or two more. Here's the C curve. It looks complicated. But in fact, well, it's very much like the Koch curve. All you do is you start with uh, a straight line. Somewhere down there, a straight line. Yeah, a straight line. And you replace the line by two lines, like this. Two lines. And now every line is replaced by two lines. So you have to be patient with this one for a while. But if you keep doing this, I'm doing this because this guy is going to appear again in a little while. If you do this for a while, replacing every line by two lines, and then finally in the limit, if you do a lot of uh, iterations, that uh, magically that C curve will emerge. Okay, so that's enough of that. <coughs> again, it doesn't matter what you start with. Instead of starting with uh, a straight line, we can start with a triangle. And again, it'll look a little crazy to begin with, but if you persevere, since these things are attractors, then no, no matter what you start with, and no matter how crazy it looks like in sort of intermediate steps, if you're perseverant enough, eventually you'll get to the C-curve. So it's beginning to emerge. You can see it. And here it is. So start with straight lines, start with triangles, but if you like, you'll get there. Now, why is this important? Well... Suppose I have something where I don't know what to start with. So with the Sierpinski gasket, I kind of knew to start with a triangle, although it didn't really matter. And with the Koch curve, I had that triangular pulse. But suppose I give you something like this. It's not so clear what I should start with. But remember, it doesn't really matter as long as I know the transformations. So what are the transformations? Well, they're the self-similar parts. So here you see a part that's just a scaled-down version of the whole. So if I scale by a hair from this corner... I'll map the whole fractal into this piece. That's one of the transformations. Here's another piece. So if I scale from this corner and then translate over here, that's the second transformation. And here's a third piece. So again, I have to do some rotation and translation to map this into that, but those are the three transformations. And once I know that, it doesn't matter what I start with. So I'll start with a straight line, and I'll apply those transformations, and we'll get the fractal. So here's a straight line, and if you have faith that I got the right transformations, then, you know, you have three lines and nine lines, and it'll go on for a while, but eventually I'll wind up with the fractal. There we go. So 27 lines. You know, in the beginning, it doesn't look like much, but if you persevere, it'll show up. And that's just the nature of the beast. That's how fractal, these kind of fractals work. But again, you might say, well, that's interesting. Whatever you start with, you get this. Suppose I want some kind of ver warped version of it like that. How am I going to get that? Whatever I start with, I got the other one. I want to get this. Well, again, my argument is this, this is a Bezier curve. We'll come back to that. Well, okay, back to uh, just some notes here. Just refresh your memory how I did this. But I'm really looking at our fixed point theorem. So what's a fixed point of a transformation is just that you apply some transformation to a point, you get back the point. Okay? And I'm going to look at maps that bring things closer together. Those are called contractive maps. And then there's a famous theorem that says if you have contractive maps on a complete space, complete means every Cauchy sequence converges, don't worry. Anyway, if you apply contractive maps on a nice space and you iterate them, that's what we were doing, we were iterating some transformations, then the iteration will always converge, always converge, and always converge to the same thing. And that's what we saw. Right? It didn't matter what I started with with the fractals. It always converged, and it always converged to the same thing. And that's what's behind this. And we can talk about the details, but not really go into the details. The objects we're looking at are compact sets. The distance formula is the Hausdorff metric. The space is complete. You iterate. You have a collection of transformations. Think in the Sapinski gasket, I had three 
transformations at the corners. I apply these transformations to some set. It doesn't matter what I pick. I iterate the transformations and converge to the fractal. That's what I was showing you. OK. So again, just to reiterate, we have these properties of fractals. They're self-similar. The, these transformations I applied get, generate self-similar parts. They had fractional dimensions, other properties. The, the property I'm most interested in is they're attractors. Right? It doesn't matter what I start with. They're attractors. And here are the properties of Bezier curves. They have control points, unlike fractals. And they have parameterizations, unlike fractals. So here's the comparison side by side. So the, I want to show you these are the same thing. So the first thing I want to convince you of is that uh, these Bezier curves, these polynomials, are actually attractors. So here we have attractors on the fractal side. I want to show you that polynomials are the same thing. They better be attractors. So let's look at that. I want to show you that polynomials are actually attractors. That, you know, before I said, well, they depend on the control points, but maybe that was a lie. Here's a, a nice control polygon for a Bezier curve. We'll run subdivision, and sure, it generates the Bezier curve. We're not surprised. But let's start with something else. Let's start with a straight line. I claim there's an algorithm that will generate two lines, then four lines, then eight lines, and then you'll get the Bezier curve. It's an attractor. It doesn't matter what you start with. I'll explain why in a minute. You can even start with a single point. Run this algorithm, which I'll show you in a minute, and you'll get more points. And if you're perseverant enough, you'll get the Bezier curve. Doesn't matter what you start with. You can start with, you take a more complicated control polygon. So you get a little bit wilder uh, subdivision algorithm. And so the subdivision, of course, converges to this nice curve with a self intersection. You might say, well, that's not self similar, but. What the hell? Let's start with something different. That's not the same control polygon. That's the control polygon for the other curve, but we'll apply our algorithm. Now we get this crazy-looking control polygon, right? But we'll iterate our, sub, our, uh, our algorithm. And uh, my claim is we'll converge to this new, nice new curve with the self-intersection point. So it's an attractor. Bezier curves are attractors, just like fractals. Start with a single point. You get two points, and you get four points. And if you're persistent, you get lots of points, and you'll get back the curve, just like in fractal. So how am I doing this? You know, how does this work? And I'll say a word about that. What's the magic behind splines or polynomials being attractors? So here's subdivision. Here's, here's the picture again. I start with some curve, and I'm going to split it into two parts. Here's the algorithm. So the Q's and the R's somehow depend on the P's. You can see that just from the diagram, there's some formula for getting the Q's and the R's from the P's. And you can write that in that formula explicitly in terms of matrices. So I've written down these two matrices here. And the Q's are, well, you take L as the left matrix times the P, and R is the right matrix times the P. And you, you can you know, check the details, but it's clear there's some matrix. And I've, you can believe me, these are the right matrices. OK, so now we have these matrices, and if you apply them, you get subdivision. That's how subdivision works. It gets you from the P's to the Q's and the R's. Now, I want to generate um, contractive maps that are going to be attractors. And here's how you do it. You take the, that will depend, of course, on the control points, because I always want to get the same curve independent of what I start with. So I'm going to write down these two transformations. So here's one transformation. Here's the, here's the second one. And the game is. OK, so you have the L's and the R's. Those are the matrices. P's are the matrix of control points, P inverse of the inverse of that. And now I have two transformations. Now, you might worry about the inverse, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, if you apply, if you multiply, say, the left matrix by P and you run through it, the P and the P inverse cancel. And what you get is L applied to P, which you know is Q. That's how we started. That's, we defined L to be the thing that if you multiply by P, you get Q. And the same thing with R. So if you multiply P by R, you're going to get R. And now you iterate this, and you're going to generate exactly subdivision, which means you're going to converge to the curve. But remember that with these kind of transformations, if they're contractive, it doesn't matter what you start with. So the control points are already built in. The P's, the P, the the matrix of control points is built in to LP and, and RP. And so it doesn't matter what you start with. You know if you start with control points, you'll converge to the curve. And if you just start with anything, because it's fractal-like, you'll converge to the curve. 
same thing. The only problem is, of course, P is not an invertible matrix because P is, you know, it, it, the control points consist of, say, points in the plane. So you have an X and a Y. So the columns, it's maybe two columns, but you can have lots of control points. So it's sort of an N by two matrix. So maybe I cheated by uh, saying I could invert P. But there are ways around that. So if P has uh, three control points, well, I'll just add a column of ones. So if you know graphics, this is just homogeneous coordinates. If you have four control points, you add two new columns. Five control points, you add three new columns. And the thing you can show is that when I add columns, these matrices are always invertible, as long as, say, three of the points are not collinear. So now you have invertible matrices, and you can run your algorithm. So now you're running your algorithm in a higher dimension, right? because I've added coordinates to the control points. It doesn't really matter. You run your algorithm in the higher dimension, and then when you want to look at the curve, you just project down to two dimensions, because the algorithm works on each coordinate independently. And that's what you're looking at. So you're looking at the projection of a higher dimensional fractal. That's what I showed you. That's one way to do it. The other way is there's actually only one Bezier curve. It's a Bezier curve in high dimensions it's called the normal curve. And it's the curve with these control points. So each control point has, has a 1 in one position and 0 everywhere else. And when you multiply those control points by the Bernstein polynomials, you get this curve. So this curve has one of these basis functions in each coordinate. And it's called the normal curve. And an arbitrary Bezier curve just takes this normal curve and multiplies it by the control points. Now you multiply this B of T, this is this curve, by the transpose of the control points, and what you get is exactly a formula for the Bezier curve. So what we're going to do is subdivide the normal curve using our left and right subdivision matrices. Now we have the right dimension, and then we'll project when we want to see the ordinary Bezier curve. And that's what we do. So these two matrices, which I showed you, give me subdivision. That's my, uh, those are the transformations I apply to the normal curve in this high dimensional space. And when I want to look at the ordinary Bezier curve, I project to two dimensions by multiplying by the control points. And again, you can see that that's the fractal nature of the curve. Okay. So what I've shown you so far is that Bezier curves, in some sense, behave like fractals. They're self-similar. I have these transformations, I iterate them, and it'll converge to the Bezier curve, and these are attractors, independent of what I start with. But that's kind of interesting, but I think it's more interesting to show you that fractals, that's, that um, I've shown you the fractal nature of splines, I want to show you the spline nature of fractals. That is, I want to show you that fractals really have control points. I mean, the point about Bezier curves is you can manipulate them. You can change their shape in a natural way by moving these control points around. And they have nice parameterizations. You can run through the curve point by point. And if, fractals are the, if, if splines and fractals are the same thing, then not only should um, splines have a fractal nature, but fractals should have a spline nature. And that's the last thing I want to show you today. So fractals with control points, how does that work? So this all started because my wife gave me a book for my birthday on complex numbers. She knows what I like to read. <laughs> There was a history of complex numbers starting from the Middle Ages and sort of winding up in the 19th century because too much going on now. And it was very interesting, and I decided, well, gee, you know, maybe we should be able to apply complex numbers to, uh, I don't know, to graphics or something. It might be interesting to do that. So, okay, so let's go to the complex numbers and see what we can do. So let's go back to Bezier curves. So a Bezier curve is just uh, a... Tr uh, <laughs> A uh, function, say, from the real numbers or some subset of the real numbers into the plane. We'll just look at plane or Bezier curves. So you have an x component and a y component. They're both polynomials. And I've written it down here. And now, so the, the control point, P, you know, has an x component and a y component. And, of course, a point in the plane I can represent by a complex number. So nothing new here, really. Just representing the points by complex numbers. Fine. And I still have, you know, the algorithms I had before. But, you know, let's get more complex. This, you know, if you have an identity that works for the reals, a polynomial identity that's true for your reals, a real identity that's true for every real, it's also going to be true for every complex number. A, uh, and a polynomial identity, if it's true for enough points, you know, one more than a degree or something, then it's true for everything, real or complex. So just use that idea, you know, that if, if it worked for the reals, it's going to work for the complexes. So I'm going to extend Bezier curves instead of having functions from some subset of, of the reals into the complex numbers into the plane. Let's have a function from some subset of the complex numbers into the complex numbers. Let's see what I get. So I'll, I'll rewrite my Bernstein polynomials with a complex variable. So instead of t being real, z is complex. 
right? And here's my formula for, quote, Bezier curves. Z is complex, and the control <laughs> points now, Ws, those are also complex. Let's try it out, okay? And now, well, I don't know what the subject is, but uh, we can try our subdivision algorithm and see what happens to it. So let's do that. So what happens if we subdivide a Bezier curve, not a real number, like a half or two-thirds or something, but at a complex number, so half plus a half i? What's going to happen? I don't know. We'll try it out. Will it converge? What does the limit curve look like? Is it related at all to this complex Bezier-Bernstein thing I defined on the previous page? How is that related to it? That's what I want to look at. So here's my de Castillo evaluation algorithm again. Here's my subdivision algorithm. R was real before. Well, what if R was complex? Just run the algorithm, right? So you're going to get the Qs and you get to get the Rs. I mean, you can run this algorithm. It computes something. Let's just see what happens. So let's look at some examples. So uh, here's a straight line. It's a Bezier curve. And if we subdivide it, we subdivide it into two straight lines and then into four straight lines, and you can continue and get lots of straight lines. Now, the point is that a straight line is, is like a fractal. It's self-similar. Right? You can divide it up into equal parts. That's not a big surprise. But now let's add a complex component to our subdivision parameter. So I'm going to increase my complex component here, and suddenly something emerges off of the straight line. It looks like that. If you don't recognize that, I'll just run a little more subdivision on it. And it's a curve we've seen before. It's the C curve. It's a fractal. All I've done is I've subdivided not at a half, but a half plus a half I. Right? And we have these you know, control points. Oops. So I can move these control points around, you know, adjust my, my fractal, at least the position. Now that may, that's a little bit exciting, but you know, I could have more control points. Let's start with that three control points. After all, the C curve, you replace a line by two lines. So let's start with that. We can do, uh, oh, maybe I should, yeah, okay, let's do subdivision. So if we do subdivision in the reals, we get this parabola. But if now if I introduce this complex component, again, you see kind of that. And you know, if I do some more subdivision, I'll get, I'll get a version of the C curve. But if you look at this C curve, this side here is curved. It's curved. If you look at the original C curve, it's straight. It's flat, right? So we've introduced some curviness into the C curve. And that's what these control points do, right? I can move these control points around. You know, change the position and kind of shape of the curve, but it's always going to be some warping of the C curve. Right? You look at it, there it is. Now we can do this pretty much for any of the fractals I showed you before. Let's see, what's this one? Well, again, if I do uh, straight lines, nothing too interesting, but if I give, introduce a complex component on this one, what's happening here is I'm joining a Koch curve. So here, remember, with the Koch curve, we had four transformations. So instead of subdividing a Bezier curve into two pieces, I'm going to split it into four. So split it into two, split it into two again, and iterate that. And if you do that, you can generate the Koch curve. Here it is, and you can move it around. But again, it's more exciting if you put more control points in. So this might be more natural control points for the Koch curve. If I don't have a complex component and I do subdivision, then I just get you know, some polynomial curve. But now if I introduce a complex component, right, you can see that Koch curve just popping out. And now I can, uh, I can manipulate the control points. And just like with a spline or a polynomial or Bezier curve, you know, it follows the shape. Right? So I have a way of controlling the shape in the same way I controlled polynomials. I can control these, uh, these fractals. Here's the Sierpinski gasket you know, with two control points. But more exciting, you know, I could have more control points. And remember, I showed you this warped Sierpinski gasket, and that's how I got it. This is a Bezier curve, three control points, subdivision in the complex domain. And I can pull on these control points, and it'll change the shape right, in some way. Okay. And finally, that, uh, that Hangman fractal. Here's two control points, but here's it with more control points and warped. So let me say a word about how this works and why this works. So here was our, here's what's happening with our algorithm. So when we do, when R is real, when I subdivide a real parameter, I'm just going to look at, at the straight line now, just at two points. So I'm going to generate a point on the line. Right? So the point I generate is that. Let's back up. Yeah, 
let's just do the subdivision algorithm for two points. So here's the Q that I generate, 1 minus R and R. Here it is, and you see that's just this point. And that point's on the line joining P0 and P1, a distance R along that line. But if I introduce a complex component, so now instead of subdividing at a real point R, I subdivide at a complex point written in polar coordinates, say R e to the i theta, what does this do? When I write it out, I get this. So I, I have my initial control point, W0, and now I have this times this vector. That's the vector joining W0 and W1. I scale it by R, just as before, but now I multiply by e to the i theta. Multiplication by e to the i theta is a rotation. It's rotation by theta degrees in the complex plane. So I'm rotating off of the line. The picture is here. So here's the real picture. When I have two points, I, pick, I generate a point along the line, but here's the complex picture. I start with these two points in the complex plane, and I'm going to rotate off the line by this, uh, by this, by this angle. And that's what you saw with the C curve. You know, when, when I had two points and I subdivided with the reals, I stayed on the line. But as soon as I introduced the complex parameter, I came off the line, and, and I got some interesting fractals. So theorems, there are actually theorems here. It says every fractal you can generate by these transformations, like the Sierpinski gasket or the Kalk curve, or any, the tra any, cur any fractal I can generate in that format, using only translations, rotations, and uniform scaling. So I restrict my transformation just to that, comp composites of those. I can generate with subdivision, with Bezier subdivision, using complex parameters. And there's an algorithm for doing that. That is, if you give me the matrices that are generating your fractal, I can tell you what, what complex numbers to subdivide at. It's automatic, so you don't have to think about it. Just write down this algorithm. The converse is false, by the way. You, you get new fractals this way, but of course, we saw we can warp the Sierpinski gasket into something that uh, doesn't have straight lines as edges. So as, as long as we have degree bigger than one, we're going to get new things. And not only that, but the new things are, are interestingly related to the old things. So they're conformal. So let me show you what that means. So go back to our pictures. If you look at the original fractal I had here before I warped it, the lines are all perpendicular to each other. You look at, you see perpendicular lines. If you look at the new one, they're still perpendicular to each other. Okay, things are curvy now, but all the lines are still perpendicular to each other. So the transformations are conformal in the sense that they don't change angles. They'll change shape, but they'll change size maybe, but they won't change angles. So all these transformations are conformal. When do they converge? Well, in the real case, my subdivision converged when my parameter r, my subdivision parameter was between 0 and 1. And that was just because I needed to be somewhere on this line between p0 and p1. So this portion of the line had to be a scaled down version of the whole line, and so did this portion. For a complex parameter, again, I have two conditions. The scaling, scaling part of e to the i theta had to be between 0 and 1, and I also had to satisfy this constraint. And what that constraint says is that both of these lines, this one and this one, have to be smaller than the original line. So it's a contractive transformation. Once I have that, I'm going to get uh, convergence. A question back there? Are you not allowing, in your mind, the formal theory of functions of equivalence, are you not allowing conversion? You're not allowing the formal transformation? Uh, well, okay, that's a good question. I shouldn't wander away from the microphone. So the question is, am I, I'm not allowing inversions when I do this. And the answer is, uh, in this talk, I'm not, because in this talk, I'm talking about uh, polynomial curves. But if I talked about rational Bezier curves, then I could allow inversion. So the, all this can be gener generalized to the rational setting, and then I can get things like 1 over z, and then I can get inversions. But I didn't do that for this talk, but it's clear that you could do that. So, yeah, you can get, you can get inversions as well. That okay? That's right. Okay. Other questions? I haven't been looking up, so... Maybe you've accumulated questions while I was looking down at my notes. Okay, good. All right, so we have convergence. And what do we converge to? Well, remember that Bezier, that complex Bezier function I wrote down? What we're converging to is, well, z of t is what you get if you have only two control points. So back here. So for this curve, here's z of t. That's what you get if you subdivide and have only two control points at some parameters. And now what you converge to, what is this? That's, that's the, an image of z of t. So that says, well, 
and take your, your Bezier curve, your Bezier function, the complex domain, evaluate it, your Bernstein functions at z of t, that's a curve, and the new curve you get will be a warping of that. And since these are polynomials, and that's why you get conformal transformations. You, you have uh, conformal transformations of, of the complex plane. Polynomials are known to be conformal. Okay. I said I'd give you parameterizations for fractals as well. So here's the parameterization. I'm going to do subdivision and show you how to parameterize any curve when I do subdivision, whether the subdivision is real or complex. You start with a control polygon. That's what P is. You're going to subdivide into two pieces. I don't care if you subdivide it real numbers or complex numbers. You'll subdivide into two pieces. So I'll call one of the pieces P0 and one of them P1. And now you're going to iterate. So P0 will divide, subdivide into two pieces, and P1 will subdivide into two pieces. And you keep iterating. So when I go left, I'll put a 0, and when I go right, I'll put a 1. Now you can think of these indices as, as binary numbers, binary fractions. Put a decimal point in front of them. So for example, this is what? Uh, a half, this is three quarters, this is uh, one quarter, right? So you think of all these indices now as binary numbers between zero and one. Now, if you start here and you take a path through the, uh, these control polygons, what's happening? These control polygons are shrinking down. They're getting smaller and smaller. They're converging to a point on the curve. To what point on the curve are they converging? Well, if you were doing real numbers, what they would converge to is the point on the curve at this parameter, b. What is b? It's the limit of these indices. So as you go down here, you're, you look at the indices right, on, the, on the p's, you get some binary numbers, and these are converging. And they're converging to some binary number. And these control polygons, what are they converging to? They're converging to the point on the curve at the parameter value at this binary number. And that's true whether you subdivide it at real numbers or complex numbers. So that's the parameterization. Right. You want to know uh, the parameter of some point on the curve? Run through your control polygons. Right. They're converging to a point on the curve, and the parameter is exactly the limit of the indices of the control polygons. That's your parameterization. So fractals have parameterizations. Uh, I, talked, I didn't say anything about, I just talked about polynomials, but for those of you who are fans of beast lines, I'll just tell you what the theorems are, that basically the same theorems work for piecewise polynomials that work for polynomials. So if you know about B splines and knot insertion, everything I said for polynomials goes over to uh, B splines, piecewise polynomials, and you replace subdivision by knot insertion. I'm not going to go into the details of that. If you know it, fine. If you don't, well, you know it for polynomials. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the details of those theorems. Okay, just, so finally, just to end this, end the agony, what did I tell you? The main insight here was that every polynomial algorithm or identity for the real numbers is going to extend to the complex numbers. That's really the main insight here, I think. And so what I showed you is that I can apply subdivision algorithms not only for real numbers for Bezier curves, but also for complex numbers. Right, why not? Right, everything that works for the reals works for the complexes. And when I do this, and I can do knot insertion the same way, do it over the complex numbers. And when I do this, I can show you that for reasonable restrictions on these complex parameters, the algorithm will converge, and I can show you what it converged to. It's going to converge to some nice fractal, and I can predict, predict what that fractal is. Right. So I can tell you when it'll converge, and I can tell you when I'll get something smooth or when I'll get something fractal. So the conclusion is, well, the original thing I showed you is that splines have a fractal nature. That is, they're self-similar. You can generate them as attractors, which are self-similar. And what I think was more interesting is that fractals are splines. That is, they have parameterizations, just like polynomials do. And they have control points, just like polynomials do. So you can manipulate them just the way you manipulate polynomials. Change their shape, move them around in a natural way with the control structure. Finally, what comes in the future? Well, I, this is fun, but is it useful? <laughs> I don't know. It certainly doesn't have anything to what I usually do, which is geometric modeling. Right? So if I wanted to use these to make cars or tables or chairs, I don't know, maybe it's a little fractal chair. It's got a lot of holes in it, but not quite fractal. But I, you know, I don't know what it's good for. So maybe I need to think more about you know, what this is actually good for. One idea occurred to me is that you know, I can generate... Uh, you have the Bernstein basis functions were used for generating polynomials for Bezier curves. And the, one of the nice properties is they sum to one. And that's actually important for the scheme to be independent of the coordinate system. So that's called affine invariance. It doesn't matter what the coordinate system is. The curve 
or it's only <laughs> on the control points. To do that, you have to have schemes where the funding function sum to one. Now, those blending functions are polynomial, but sometimes you might want to use trigonometric blending functions, but it's hard to get those things to sum to one. On the other hand, we have a formula that the Bezier, the Bernstein polynomials, are always sum to one, whether you evaluate them at a real point or a complex point. So what if you evaluate them at e to the i theta? Well, they'll still sum to one. But you know, when you substitute e to the i theta, you get nice trigonometric functions. So maybe you could apply these trigonometric functions get affine invariant schemes now based not on polynomials but on trigonometric functions. I play with that a little. We'll see where this goes. I'm not sure. Other things you can do, you could study, instead of restricting yourself to the complex domain, you could look at things in the quaternion domain. All we really needed here was some kind of multiplication. So quaternions are nice because you represent rotations in three dimensions. Maybe you want curves that represent rotations in three dimensions. So we could do quaternion curves this way. What about surfaces? The problem with the scheme I showed you today is it works for the complex numbers, so it's going to work for curves in the plane. What about surfaces in three space? So I don't have the complex numbers to, to guide me. But it turns out you can still do much the same tricks. Work in progress. And finally, what about other kinds of fractals like Mandelbrot sets and Julius sets? Can I have control points for them? Well, in some sense, I can do things like inversion or um, translation, rotation, things like that, I can apply these to Mandelbrot sets and Julia sets. And again, this is work in progress. So you know, maybe someday we'll also have control points for the Mandelbrot set and Julia sets. We'll see. So those are the kinds of things I'm looking at. Right now, it's entertainment. Whether it'll actually be you know, useful in practice to build things, who knows? But it's fun. So thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Your turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, the point is not in C2. The point is in C. Oh, uh, the question is, when I introduce complex uh, parameters, and complex control points, and I use uh, my Bezier scheme in the complex setting, then uh, I'm actually having points not in C, but in C2. But in fact, that's not right. The, the points are actually in C. Let me see if I can go back to the formula. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this formula here, where does everything wind up in? Z is a complex number. W is a complex number. I'm multiplying. I'm getting a complex number. Just one complex number. For each Z, I get a complex number. Not in C2, but in C. So this is all going on in C, not in C2. It's a map from C to C. I mean, what, I, you really think, what I'm really doing here is I'm taking these Bezier curves or these fractals or however you want to think about them, and I'm warping them. I'm just mapping from C to C. It's a warp of C. So I'm taking things that are sort of flat in C, and I'm warping them. Everything is going on in C, not in C cross C. OK? It's, it's much simpler than you're thinking about it. Just You have to think even simpler. Right? It's really just very simple. Just very, very simple. OK? Simplify, simplify. OK, other questions? OK. I have a question. Here in SBO. Hello? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, um, so I was just wondering if this buys you something um, above and beyond. Like, does this make something possible that you couldn't get by just uh, generating your fractal and then running it through uh, a conformal uh, warp? Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm getting something that I couldn't get by generating a fractal in the old way by using some integrated function system and then warping it by applying some polynomial scheme, uh, uh, applying some transformation. Uh, uh, because the answer is no, but I think it's simpler to do it this way. And it does buy me control points. Uh, and the other way, yeah, I could take some fractal and apply some transformation to it and warp it. But here I have some what I think are rather natural control points in the same way that Bezier curves have natural control points. And that I wouldn't get if I just applied some arbitrary, you know, conformal transformation. 
So I, I think I do get something for this, namely these control Thanks. points. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Anything else from the audience or from God above? You never know who's listening, right? Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.